As a parent, how much do you really know about your child? In the age of information, people have more access to each other than ever before. We can quite literally see analytically what people like, what they don't like, and who and what interests them when. It's not just children who are chronically online, it's the parents as well. We've seen this with the rise of family bloggers. Moms and dads recording and posting the most intimate milestones in their kids' lives. But even when we only have limited information through somebody's social media or their posts, it's not uncommon for people to form an opinion. Oh, this mom said that. She's a bad mom. Oh, look, this mom did this. She's a good mom. But of course we don't really know. That's a split second of information. And yes, sometimes that information is damning enough that we know for sure this one's a bad egg. But especially when someone posts something good, it's hard to know. Is this truly the wholesome content it appears to be? Or is it fake? April Bever was a mom of seven. She got married at just 15 years old. But don't worry, she wasn't pregnant. That's important to April that you know that. It was just that her and David were in love and they wanted to go down to Texas to make things official. In Texas in 1987, you could get married as minors so long as you had parental approval, and you didn't have to be pregnant. In Oklahoma, where April and David were from, you did have to be pregnant, so that wasn't an option. It was a little bit dramatic, and for most people, it probably would have been a huge mistake. In fact, in hindsight, she would never let her own daughter do something like that now. But hey, it worked out for her and David. She considered them to be an exception to the rule. I mean, they'd been happily married for decades now. They had seven kids, a big house, new cars, and everyone was happy, so it was fine. At least that's the impression you would get from April's Reddit posts over the years. She would talk about homeschooling her kids how much they loved it. How, despite what people might think, having a family of nine is a totally practical option so long as you budget properly and you make good decisions. I mean, they were a single income family. David got a good job because he worked hard. And before you say that it's impossible to split your attention evenly among that many kids, April would say that that is completely untrue. In fact, her kids were probably overexposed to her, if anything. Even though David had a high salary job with HP, they actually let him work from home. And on top of that, April homeschooled all seven of her children. So not only were both parents in the home, they were in the home with the kids all day. And I mean all day. Despite the fact that they'd lived there for almost 20 years, most of the neighbors had never seen the children. The blinds were always drawn. The kids didn't leave in the morning to go to school or anything because they were homeschooled. In fact, the only way that the people who lived next door knew that there were children in the house, let alone seven, was because there were a couple kids' toys out back by the pool. So they just had to assume kids probably lived there, even though they never saw them outside. It was to a point that when the police came around the neighborhood asking, hey, why was this family annihilated? What would the motive be? The neighbors didn't know. They could guess that it probably had something to do with the fact that the nine of them never left the house, but that was just guessing. They had no idea that any of this was for clout. How could they? You have to be a real psycho to kill your family to get famous. And welcome back for another spooky Saturday. I'm really impressed with you guys. Thank you guys so much. You have been subscribing like crazy actually. And it's making me feel really good. Like I was really kind of like, I don't know. I don't want to say insecure, but I was like nervous about doing long form content. It's just so much more work. And I'm really used to like the short form on TikTok, but like, you guys have been making me feel really confident about how I've been doing so far. So thank you guys so much. It seriously means a lot to me. Now, before we start this video, I just want to give a brief disclaimer. I'm going to have a 911 call in here. It's very disturbing. I'm putting timestamps below so that you can elect to skip that, but I just don't want anybody to like accidentally listen to it, not knowing that it's coming and then be like traumatized by it because it is really very visceral. I just want to warn you way in advance. 
If all you knew from the Bever family was what April, the mother, had posted on Reddit, then you would think, okay, this is a big family. It's a little old school. I mean, especially with how young the parents were when they got married, but it seems wholesome enough. The mom only posts about how grateful she is to be a mother, advice for other parents who are homeschooling their kids, detailing things such as what homeschooling programs they're currently doing, which ones they've tried before, different pros, different cons, alongside random posts about her life. My family and I watched this Christmas movie this year, and we loved it or we hated it. My daughter just painted her nails with me. It was such a sweet moment. Look how they turned out. But it wasn't all sunshine and roses. In fact, the youngest of the Bever kids, Autumn, had had a lot of health complications. She was born premature and her parents were really worried about her. They had never had these kind of problems with any of their kids before. It was such a harrowing experience for the Bevers that they decided to start a nonprofit so that they could help out other families. If these Reddit posts are to be believed, this family is mundane at worst and lovely at best. And I know what you may be thinking. In today's day and age, you never know if somebody's being honest online, especially parents talking about their families. A lot of people use social media for validation. They amplify the good parts of their lives while concealing the bad. And of course, there's also flex culture. And so, and because of that, it's hard to know. Is this person being authentic or am I developing a parasocial relationship with just a lovable persona? April did post about money from time to time on Reddit. She would talk about how proud she is of her husband. They're a single income family. Her husband had a good salaried job at HP. He had worked hard for that job and he had planned accordingly. That's the reason why they were able to have such a big family without their kids wanting for anything. In fact, she would go so far as to say that her children were spoiled. And by all accounts, this actually checks out. Not only did April and David have a very nice home, but they had a very nice home in a very nice neighborhood. The neighborhood that April and her husband David had lived in and built their family in for the last couple decades was actually a really nice neighborhood in a really nice area and their house was one of the nicer houses in that neighborhood. In fact, a lot of people who lived in this neighborhood were retired. These are people who have saved up their whole lives. This is their retirement fund and this is the place that they want to be. That's pretty good. April's claims on Reddit to having multiple brand new cars actually turned out to be true as well. But this is all superficial stuff that you can see from the curb. What's going on inside the house? April's claims that her children wanted for nothing, they seem to be true as well. In fact, her two older sons were really avid collectors. They had these massive collections. It seemed that April and David were more than happy to invest in their kids' interests. Well, to a point. As I'd said in the introduction, the neighbors didn't really know the family well. In fact, the kids were almost never outside. From time to time, April would take some of the kids on a walk with her, but she always kept them on a very short leash. Not literally, but figuratively. That was the impression that people in the neighborhood got. Despite the fact that there are plenty of neighborhood kids, the Bever kids were never allowed to play with them. And most people chalked this up to their fundamentalist beliefs. It's not uncommon for fundamentalist families to harbor concerns that if they let their kids be exposed to kids who haven't been raised within the same belief system, their kids may end up, air quote, corrupted and may even decide to leave the faith. With that in mind, it's also not uncommon for fundamentalist parents to then homeschool their children so that they can prevent further exposure to other belief systems or lack thereof through an educational environment. In fact, one of the benefits to homeschooling is that you can sort of veto the curriculum to a certain extent. It was really important to David and April that all of their children are homeschooled through accredited programs. Because if you don't do an accredited program, a lot of employers will not consider that diploma to be legitimate. It was incredibly important to them that their children secure high paying jobs. And because of David's background in tech, most of the kids were planning to enter that industry as well. Robert, the oldest of the Bever children, acted as a sort of guinea pig, as most eldest children do, as far as the homeschooling process was concerned. 
They had him do it through an accredited school, but it was through the mail. So he would get his assignments mailed to him, he would complete them, he would mail them back, and then his teachers would grade them and then send them back again. As I'm sure you can tell, that's a really inefficient process, and so it wasn't long before April found herself getting agitated just purely with the amount of time it took to get new assignments or to get grades back. So it wasn't long before she switched over to online school. And it seemed like that worked much better for the family because the rest of the children who were of schooling age also took online classes. And while April and David found a lot of value in the fact that their children couldn't be socially corrupted by other kids or curriculums that they were uncomfortable with, one of the obvious major drawbacks to homeschooling is that your children are not going to get the same socialization experience as most kids. To combat this, there are a lot of homeschool programs that have kids meet in groups so that they can still have some semblance of a classmate experience and interact with their peers a little bit. But it seems that because April and David had so many children, they thought that that was socialization enough. And honestly, it's hard to know just what the atmosphere of the home was. Because not only did the children not really play outside as the neighbors had testified to, but the blinds were also always drawn. So even if the neighbors decided to get really, really nosy, there was only so much that they could ascertain about this family. And that's what makes the family's digital footprint so important. Though David worked with computers, he wasn't very active on social media. And as we know, April would doom scroll on Reddit all day, but they weren't the only ones with access to a computer. In fact, I think it's more than fair to say that the two oldest boys, Michael and Robert, were chronically online. And much like me right now, Robert actually had a YouTube channel. I watched some of his videos, and to be fair to him, when he was making them, it was sort of like the early 2000s. People didn't have the same media literacy that they have today. So I don't want this to come off as like harsh or judgmental about his like air quote content style. His videos are just random. It's, it's really just like him talking into the screen, just throwing stuff out there to see what sticks. There's not really any sort of like niche or strategy or anything like that. I think like a lot of kids, he just watched YouTube all the time, saw some other people his age and thought like, hey, I wanna try doing that too. But then with that in mind, it's not super surprising that he didn't end up getting any sort of traction or anything like that. He was also not a super consistent poster either. It just seems to me like a classic instance of coming of age and being like, hey, I'm gonna post on YouTube, I'm gonna blow up, and then doing it and being like, oh, I got like five views. Okay, I guess it's like harder than I thought. It didn't seem like he was taking it too serious anyway. His brother Michael was in a couple of his videos too, and I think it's more than safe to say that Michael and Robert were not only brothers, but best friends. From what glimpses we do get into their lives from their YouTube channel, it just seems like most of their day, they probably spent just goofing around getting into classic brotherly shenanigans. And when Robert turned 18, he finally got his chance to get out of the house. He actually got a job at a local call center called Micatech for a couple months. This was really his first sort of venture into like the real world. This is his first time really stepping outside of the bubble of his family. And it's the first opportunity he has to make friends that he's not literally related to. I couldn't really find any details on what exactly his job position was, but I suspect it was some sort of temp job, just because of his age and the fact that this is his first real job. But what I do know is that while he was working at this call center, he confided in one of his coworkers. And what he told them was actually really interesting. He told them not only does he not believe in God the way the rest of his family does, but he also really didn't like being homeschooled. And his coworker ended up getting the impression that Robert actually really resented the way that his parents had raised him. But if you had asked David, he would have told you that by comparison, he was a huge softie. When he was growing up, his dad not only shared the same fundamentalist beliefs that he had now passed on to his own children, but he was much more strict. He was a severe disciplinarian. And it wasn't a situation where David was just a black sheep or something like that. He treated all of his children that way. That was just who he was as a father. I mean, one time David forgot to turn a light off downstairs and his father dragged him down the stairs so that he hit every single step on the way down just to teach him a lesson about forgetfulness. I mean, compared to that, David was a saint. On top of that, David and April considered themselves to be very supportive parents. Robert and Michael had a lot of interests. And like I'd said earlier, 
they were more than happy to fund those hobbies. I mean, for one, Robert and Michael loved collecting weapons. And David and April always let them do that. They would buy them knives, they would buy them hatchets, protective gear, any and all accessories they required. Would an unsupported parent do that? More than that, they had taught their children how to foster natural curiosity and a love for learning. Not only could Robert and Michael recite off of the top of their heads every mass shooting in the history of the United States, but they also knew all the stats on every major serial killer. They loved frequenting forums and chat rooms talking about serial killers, about how cool they were, about how awesome it would be to have that type of notoriety. And even though some might consider that to be sort of strange and alarming behavior, April and David were still supportive. Would a bad parent do that? Then, on July 22nd, 2015, April asked her 13-year-old daughter, Crystal, if she could remind Michael and Robert, who were 16 and 18 respectively, that they needed to do the dishes before they went to bed. Crystal obediently agreed, and she walked over to Michael and Robert's room. When she cracked open the door and poked her head in, she saw Michael and Robert putting on their body armor with the entirety of their weapons collection laid out on their beds. She didn't really think too much of this because, again, they loved this stuff, and in fact, she was about to turn around and leave since she had already told them what she came to say. And her brother Michael turns to her and says, hey, you gotta look at this. So Crystal opens the door the rest of the way, walks into the room, and it isn't until she leans over the desk that she understands just what a mistake she has made. Because it's at that moment that her brother Michael steps behind her and swiftly slits her throat. But this isn't a movie or some online incel forum. This is real life. When you slit someone's throat, they don't tend to just go quietly into their good night. It makes a huge mess. Their survival instincts kick in. Unless you've actually cut their vocal cords, they're able to scream. And that's exactly what Crystal does. She starts screaming, clawing, lashing out for her life. And her brothers were not expecting this. They start frantically stabbing her in the stomach and the arms, doing whatever they can to get her quiet. But it's too late. April hears Crystal's guttural screams and comes rushing down the hall. And the commotion that her entrance causes gives Crystal just enough time to slip away and make a run for the front door. And as Crystal runs for her life, she can hear the pained screams of her mother in the background. April is running down the hall trying to escape her two eldest sons who are determined to kill her. They are stabbing at any and every part of her that they can. They are determined to get her down. And unfortunately, they would succeed. April was found dead on her couch with over 50 stab wounds. Meanwhile, Crystal's still running. She knows that if she can just make it outside, if she can get the neighbor's attention, that maybe she can save her family. She has no idea what her brothers have planned, but it's clearly not good. But one of the problems with having a big house in a nice neighborhood is you tend to have a lot of land. And when Crystal made it outside of the front porch, she looked out and she knew she still had to make it not only across the entirety of the lawn, but also through a thick line of trees if she had any hope of getting the neighbor's attention. And as she ran across the front lawn, she collapsed. Within seconds, her brother Michael was on top of her with his hands over her mouth and nose. He was pressing down on her face as hard as he could, trying to suffocate her. And in that moment, she had lost so much blood. She was so tired. She knew she couldn't possibly fight him off. And she heard a voice in her head that told her, go limp. It's the only thing you have left to do. Just play dead. And that's what she did. Michael didn't have time to check her vitals. There were still five other family members left inside the home. So he dragged her across the lawn, up the porch, and dumped her just inside the front door. And it's at this moment that Crystal heard the distant screams of her younger siblings. Christopher and Victoria, who were only seven and five, had seen Robert and Michael running around with weapons and they'd gotten scared. So they ran into a bathroom and locked themselves inside. And the more Michael and Robert screamed at them to let them in, the more scared they got. And it wasn't until one of their brothers started screaming, pleading that they were being attacked too, that they would unlock the door their final act being that of a childlike kindness and mercy, an impulse that their eldest siblings preyed upon. 
In another part of the house, 12-year-old Daniel has heard all of this, and out of fear, he locks himself in his father's home office and calls 911. Brief pause, this right here is the 911 call that I was talking about that some of you might find to be a little bit too disturbing. So like I said, there is a timestamp. You can feel free to skip this portion if you don't want to actually hear it. And I will do a brief summary afterwards for those of you who have chosen to skip it. Broken Arrow 911. Broken Arrow 911. Hello? Hi. Hi, where are you at? Broken Arrow, Oklahoma 7411. What address? 709 Magnolia Court. Seven, okay. Are you the only one there? No. My brother's attacking my family. Your dad is attacking your family? No, my brother. Um, he has an idea stealing me. Oh, thank you. Can you get people to help? Okay, who's attacking your family? What? Who's attacking your family? Yes. Who, who is it? Do they? Yes, I'll call them. Oh, my God. No, my Are you there? Hello? Hi, what's going on there? What's going on there? Hello? Hello? 12 year old Daniel had just called 911 and told the dispatcher he was a little bit confused and seems to have been having a little bit of a hard time understanding him because he was forced to whisper on the line that his brothers are attacking his family. And when the operator is attempting to ask clarifying questions, suddenly Michael's voice can be heard on the line. He says hello before realizing just who his brother had called, at which point he then shatters the phone before killing Daniel. And while Daniel had been placing the call at approximately 11.30 p.m., Robert and Michael had actually been killing their father, David, upstairs in the home. But because Michael had ended the 911 call so abruptly, it immediately triggered a welfare check by local police. And when officers first arrived, they saw a pool of blood on the front porch. As they began to approach, they heard a strained voice pleading for help. They then forced their way in, only to find Crystal directly in front of them bleeding out. They pulled her to safety and then immediately rushed her to intensive care. But had that phone call not been placed by Daniel, there would have been no survivors. Despite the fact that he didn't make it out, he still managed to save his sister. Upon further inspection, all who had died had a collective of 100 knife wounds, with April possessing half of those wounds. Investigators came to the conclusion that April, the mother, seemed to be the focus of the attack because her injuries were much more gruesome and concentrated compared to everybody else in the family. Michael and Robert had actually heard the police arrive, and when they did, they ran out the back door into the woods. Because the woods were sort of dense, the police brought out dogs, and it was not long before Michael and Robert were tracked down and apprehended. And when they were arrested, they did not resist. They were found covered in their family's blood. Robert was actually still armed with one of the knives that they had used. And because the police had gotten there in time and were able to successfully transport Crystal from the scene, she was actually actually able to testify against her brothers. So between all of that, there was essentially no getting out of it. There was actually one other survivor besides Crystal, though she wasn't able to testify against anyone. And that's Baby Autumn. Because of when Daniel had called, the police were able to arrive in time to interrupt the attack. It wasn't that Baby Autumn was spared out of some sort of goodness in Michael and Robert's hearts. It was just a matter of timing. They weren't in a rush to kill Autumn because she was only two years old. There was no real chance of her escaping or fighting back. And so because of that, she just wasn't a very high priority and they ended up running out of time. And beyond the fact that Daniel's call ended up being the thing that literally saved his sister's lives, investigators believe due to the nature of how closed off this family was from the outside world, likely would have gotten away with all of this had investigators not been alerted to the fact that the family was being annihilated. David worked from home. They could have easily impersonated him, asked for some PTO, or even just quit on his behalf. And of course, April was a stay-at-home mom who seemed to rarely leave the house. 
And as for the kids, they're all homeschooled, they have no friends outside the family, and the neighbors are used to little to no activity in the house. No one will notice that they're gone for potentially years at a time. And if the scene in the home wasn't traumatizing enough, because mind you, nothing like this had ever happened in this town before. These investigators were not prepared to deal with a crime this gruesome or to this magnitude. This was incredibly traumatizing to everyone who responded to the scene. But as if that wasn't enough, once they began actually questioning the boys, things got significantly more disturbing. When the police had initially reported the scene and they started surveying the house, they noticed that weapons and protective gear were everywhere. And it was honestly way too much, even given the gruesome scene in the home. The vast majority of those weapons went unused. But during the questioning process, one of the brothers let it slip that their plans were on a USB drive in the home. And when the police had confiscated all the computers, all of the tech, all of the security cameras, they found that USB. You see, it all started out as sort of a joke. People often talk about how dark humor is just that, humor. It's not serious. No one's actually trying to hurt anyone. But for Michael and Robert, that wasn't the truth. What started out as dark jokes about hurting people, becoming serial killers, killing their family, would end up escalating into an incredibly serious reality. Suddenly, they were no longer joking about becoming serial killers and hurting their family and going on a killing spree. And instead, they were daydreaming about being more infamous than the Columbine shooters, which is, by the way, a cliche. For some reason, this is the epicenter in incel communities and other violent forums. And the fact that the boys had no criminal records results in two very important things. One, the lack of criminal record makes this a very jarring escalation for law enforcement. Two, the lack of criminal record makes this escalation incredibly unrealistic from the boys' perspectives. Because they had never committed any crimes before, including misdemeanors or petty crimes, they ended up creating these incredibly unrealistic, impractical plans. What they had set out to do was to annihilate their entire family dismember their entire family, and then simply put those limbs in boxes in their attic. They had then pre-selected 10 different locations, which they had planned to go to and kill five random strangers, resulting in the death of 50 strangers total. Robert in particular aspired to be a serial killer. He thought that he would be able to get away with these killings and then eventually begin to commit crimes on a national level, crossing state lines, hopefully in his mind, killing at least 500 people, thus cementing himself as what he perceived to be an iconic killer. This is obviously an incredibly unrealistic perspective beyond the fact that it's obviously morally corrupt and disgusting. It's just not practical. And to be honest, it's indicative of low intelligence. There's this sort of stereotype that serial killers and psychopaths and people with antisocial personality who commit violent crimes are always geniuses. And the reality is that's almost never true. The vast majority of people who have been diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder are not only harmless and nonviolent, but they actually are key members of a functional society. They're more likely to become firefighters. They're more likely to become public servants. They're more likely to succeed in a corporate environment. And on average, the worst thing they're gonna do is maybe throw a coworker under the bus to get a promotion, not literally kill their coworker American psycho style. But there's this sort of myth that's been perpetuated. And the reason I wanna touch on this is because I think it really, really, really contributes to people idolizing serial killers because there's something inherently mesmerizing about somebody who is just so clever they can get away with anything, even the worst things imaginable. But the reality of these cases is a lot less mesmerizing. And especially when it comes to the older, super well-known cases, I think it was easier for law enforcement to build up these criminals as if they were super unique and this was just a really complex case and it's like nothing they've ever seen before than it was to maybe admit fault or negligence. But one thing that Michael and Robert did have in common with those they idolized was that they too got caught. Because again, 
We only know about these famous serial killers and murderers because they didn't get away with their crimes. When the police looked through that USB drive, they had seen that Michael and Robert had planned to use their parents' home security system to document their crimes. And though there is footage of the murders, it has never been publicly released, and I don't expect that it ever will be, though it was entered as further evidence to the fact that Robert and Michael had clearly committed the crime. For some reason, Robert and Michael had believed that when they recorded everything on the home security system, they would be able to upload that footage online so that they could get digital clout while simultaneously giving different surveillance footage to the police to try and throw them off the case as if they don't also have access to the internet because ultimately that was the real motive behind all of this. They wanted fame. They had also ordered 3,000 rounds of ammunition to their house the day before the murders which they luckily never used. The implications of that amount of ammunition are absolutely devastating. And despite the fact that Robert and Michael were unable to complete the rest of their plan and were unable to kill those 50 additional people, it didn't matter because the crime that they had already committed was literally the worst crime that had ever happened in Broken Arrow history. The brothers were charged with five counts of first degree murder and one count of assault and battery with intent to kill. And on July 25th, authorities announced that despite the fact that Michael was 16, he would be tried as an adult. The conviction of the first degree murder charge alone would result in life in prison at best and the death penalty at worst. And Michael's legal team was not happy with the fact that he was going to be tried as an adult. They tried to argue that life in prison was not an appropriate punishment for Michael, that he was simply a younger brother following in his older brother's footsteps, trying to look cool, trying to impress him, and that what he really needed was the opportunity for rehabilitation because life in prison would essentially be a death sentence. The DA then decided that Michael due to his age, would be exempt from the death penalty, but he would not be exempt from life in prison. Because as it turns out, life in prison is not a death sentence. A death sentence is death. And unlike the majority of Michael's family, he was still alive whether he was in prison or not. This is not to say that Michael's attorney was ignored, by the way. He was still set on rehabilitation as an option but in order for that to be a real option, he would have to prove that Michael had been abused and that that was the primary motivation behind his actions. And despite what people may think about April and David's parenting style and their choices as parents, no one was able to find any hard evidence of abuse. The only people claiming abuse were Robert and Michael, and they had lost all credibility. Once Michael's team realized that the abuse allegations weren't getting them anywhere, they just continued to pin it all on Robert. And during the court process, Robert actually attempted to take his own life via hanging in his cell by wrapping a bed sheet around his neck. However, he was intercepted by the guards and he actually was found to be completely unharmed he was then moved to a different cell so that he could be more closely watched. Despite the fact that both Robert and Michael had literally confessed to the crimes, been caught in 4K on cameras committing the crimes, Crystal, whose throat was slit by her brothers, confirmed that they were the ones who slit her throat, they were found covered in blood, and they confessed to all of their future crimes that they were planning to commit to the police, Michael and Robert still decided on September 3rd to plead not guilty. Then on August 5th of 2016, the details of the case were made publicly available. It's at this point that the city of Broken Arrow decided that they wanted to raise money so that they could purchase the Bever home, demolish it, and turn it into a memorial park for the family. But before the city was able to raise the funds, the Bever home mysteriously burnt down. In fact, the neighbors say that it was the most fierce fire they have ever seen. It went up like a tinderbox and it just stayed burning. That leads me to suspect arson, but I'm not that mad at it because 
the city was then able to take that property and actually turn it into a memorial park for this family. So you can feel free to tell me your theories in the comments. Do you think the city contacted the local fire department and asked them to get this thing going? Or do you think it was just somebody from the neighborhood, someone random who lived in the city who knew about the case and just wanted to make sure this park got built? Or do you think it was a complete and utter coincidence or maybe a gift from the universe. I personally don't think it was a coincidence. I think that it's arson, but that's just me. Robert did eventually plead guilty and he was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. And Michael was also sentenced to life, but he was given the possibility of parole most likely due to the fact that he was underage. And as a part of their sentence, they are not allowed to be housed in the same prison. Since sentencing, we haven't heard any updates on Michael, which leads me to believe he's not doing anything he's not supposed to be doing. Meanwhile, we do have one update as of 2019 on Robert. On July 15th, he apparently snuck up behind two officers who were on duty at the time in his prison with a weapon but he was intercepted by a third officer before he was able to sneak attack them. The third officer picked him up in a bear hug, commanded him to drop the weapon, and he eventually did. I don't have any further information on why he chose to attack those officers, if there was a reason he chose to attack them in particular, or if he was just lashing out, they happened to be on shift. I really don't know, but that's the most recent update that I have on Robert. Yeah, this case is, just so, sort of a, a weird one. I mean, there's just so many known unknowns. There's a, a real lack of information, which I think can inspire a lot of curiosity. For me, looking at this case, it has a lot of notable similarities to the wife swap case, which if you haven't seen my video about the wife swap case, not only is it in the same playlist, but I will set it at the end of this video as a play next option, because there are some really strong parallels. Fundamentalist upbringing, homeschooling, larger family, a notable aggression towards the mother in particular. And so it brings up a classic conundrum. How much is nature? How much is nurture? We know so little about the day-to-day -day of this family. So it makes it really difficult to give an honest and fair assessment of the parent-child dynamics here. If you guys watched all the way to the end, thank you so much. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do. It really actually helps me a lot. And if you haven't liked, you know, you don't have to like if you didn't like it, but I would like it if you did. Bye!